Well, the gems are learning that the Bible is God's word, that it needs to be our lamp and light for our life. So here's just a thought for you, or just something to get the wheels turning here. Where do you, where do you go get your groceries? Maybe, maybe you go to Family Fair, maybe you go to Meijer or Walmart, maybe Save-A-Lot or Aldi. I, I, I don't know, I imagine we maybe get our groceries from different places and maybe a couple different places. And then when it's time to eat, we, we go to the cupboards and the refrigerator and we get all this food that we've, we've gotten and then we combine it and cook it and we make something to eat. That's when, when we're hungry, that's, that's what we do. We, we get our groceries and then we stock our kitchens and then when it's time to eat, then, then we, have, we have food. But where do you get your truth? Where do you get your truth? There's a lot of sources of truth out there. There's a lot of messages that are being taught. There's a lot of people who are talking. And there's a lot of stories out there that don't necessarily preach, but there's a lot of stories out there that kind of define reality for us. And that's why I put Pinocchio and Bambi and Mickey Mouse up up there. Because stories define reality for us too, in, even in subtle ways. So we stock our worldviews with sayings and statements or analogies and different kinds of experiences. Like, don't touch, touch the hot stove because your hand will get burned. Or maybe an experience like, I disobeyed mom and dad and... It wasn't that bad. And then we go off that. And then when it's time to make a decision, we'll, we'll kind of use those experiences or those analogies and sayings. And then, just like when we take a walk, we need a light to see where we're going. We, when we're charting our course in life, we need some truth of some kind to see where we are going to be going. So verse 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. We need truth to chart our lives like we need light to take a walk. So what truth lights your way? Where do you get your truth? What's the source of your truth? And then what truths do you use? When decisions need to be made, when you're looking to take your next steps, or what you're looking forward to, when you're making your plans, what sorts of truths are you using? The world will tell you lots of things and will give you lots of different truths to use. And your feelings on the inside, they'll tell you lots of things too. There'll, there'll be pressure from within to, to do this or not do that. There'll be things that you want. There'll be fears that you have. And they will try to push you in different directions too. So with all of this pushing and pulling that's, that's going on from inside and without, where, where is, what is it that we're actually following? We need to, we need to follow God. Now, the Bible is God's word to us. This, this tells us what, what God thinks, what, what He wants, what He expects from us, and what kind of a God He is. And so this is, this is invaluable for us. This is, this is great treasure. And the entire chapter of Psalm 119, it's the longest, might be the longest chapter in the entire Bible, and it's all just a meditation on Everything that God has said and how amazing it is and how great it is. So for your sermon reading tracks this week, it's just all out of here. Because it's an entire meditation on how important God's Word is to us. The Bible is like no other book. It's like no other book. First of all, 
just some facts for you. The Bible's been translated into more languages than any other book out there. So I did some looking, and I found that, uh, at least according to one source, uh, the Bible's been translated into 469 languages. It's the number one translated book. The second one is a very distant Pinocchio with 260 languages that it's been translated into. And then there, was, there were a bunch more uh, after that. Um, and I put the Koran on there because that's, that's kind of the next highest um, religious text. And that's number 11 with 112 languages. There's a bunch in between there. And then I went on Wycliffe, which uh, we prayed for Jan Van Staldine, and she works with Wycliffe. And Wycliffe's whole mission is to get the Bible in, in as many languages out there as possible. So I went on their website. This is kind of what they do. They said that the Bible, the total Bible, has been translated into over 550 languages. So that's even more than what this place listed. And that's the entire Bible. If you want to count just the New Testament or just some portions of Scripture, then we're up to 1,300 languages. The Bible is the most translated book. It's also the best-selling book every year. Now, it doesn't make the New York Times bestseller list, but that's not because it doesn't sell the most. It actually, it's actually really difficult because the Bible's published into many different translations by many different publishers, and there's all different kinds of study Bibles and things like that. And so when, when it's difficult to actually keep track of how many Bibles are sold. But I did find, find an article on this in the New Yorker, and it said that Calculating how many Bibles are sold in the United States is virtually an impossible task. Conservative estimates in 2005, this is a little while back, Americans purchased some 25 million Bibles, twice as many as the most recent Harry Potter book. The amount spent annually on Bibles has been put at more than half a billion dollars. So even today... Even today, the Bible is still the best-selling book. Isn't that amazing? This, this ancient text, these, these things that were written so long ago, you would think would be obsolete by now, but they're not. We still buy them as much today as ever before. Now, these numbers, that and this... This doesn't prove anything. This just proves that people are excited about the Bible. That doesn't prove that it's from God. These are just, these are just numbers. They are fascinating, though. How could a book and a message that's so old be so relevant even now? But that doesn't necessarily prove anything yet. How do we know that the Bible's true? That's still a valid question. How do we know that it's true? It's pretty cool that the Bible is, sells a lot and goes really far, but does that mean it's true? Well, not by itself. I mean, how did, how did we get the Bible? Did it, did it just kind of float down from heaven and in, into our hands like this? No. There were actual human beings that wrote down these things. It didn't float down from heaven. We, or human beings, wrote it down. But we still believe it's God's word. But that's kind of a strange thing. If people wrote it down, how is it, how is it God's word? But we believe that when people were writing, God was guiding. So that everything that's written here isn't from human beings, isn't just our thoughts. This is, this is from God. 
So people were writing, but it was God that was guiding. How do we know the Bible's true? Because it did not come from man, but God guided men as they wrote. So what is written is God's own communication to us. People, when they wrote, it's not like somebody decided, I'm going to sit down and write God's word today. No, no, no. People were writing, but God was guiding. And what was written ended up serving for a long time. The Holy Spirit filled those words in ways that humans never could. So, 1 Peter 1.21, Prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. 2 Timothy 3.16, All Scripture is God-breathed. It means God was behind it all. And it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Okay, so that's what we believe. But, okay, beyond that, When I'm reading this, when we read this, the Holy Spirit convinces me that it is true as I read it. This is why it's still a best-selling book. Because we can pick up any book and we can just read and we can say, oh, that's interesting, that's neat. But when, when we read this, the Holy Spirit's working in us while we read it. So that when I read this, I'm thinking, wow, this is talking to me. Or this isn't just for them. This is is true now. This isn't just some passing thoughts. This isn't just some good ideas. This, This is like eternal truths forever. This is pretty remarkable for a book that's so old. Very few books last very long, let alone continue to be bestsellers to the present day. But something a little more tangible, as we begin to trust and follow what it says, we begin to see that the promises are real and the directions are trustworthy. So that... When, verse 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. When we start to walk according to the light that Scripture gives us, so that we're stepping this way instead of this way, my path is level. Okay, this is... But if I'm thinking, well, maybe I want to go... The Bible says to go this way, but maybe I want to go this way. Okay, now... um, Okay, this is not level ground. Okay, let me try it the Bible's way. Okay, this is level ground. Which, which light are you walking by? Verses 98 through 100. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. If we're walking according to God's ways, we're going to realize, boy, there's something to this. This isn't just theory, this is real. But you only know that when you start to give it a try. All right, I'm going to go with God instead of my gut. Jesus said in John 7, My teaching is not my own. It comes from Him who sent me. If anyone chooses to do God's will, he will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. In other words, give it a try. Try me. See if what I'm actually teaching is real or if I'm just making it up. The Bible isn't God Himself, but it's from God. We do need to make a distinction there. We don't bow down to the book. We don't worship the Bible. The Bible is not God. 
but it's from God. So we listen to what it says because it is from the one that we worship. The paper and ink isn't what we value. If you, if you have a ratted and used up old Bible and, and you happen to throw it away, or, that's not the cardinal sin. Because it's not the paper and the ink, it's the message. It's the message. Verse 102. I have not departed from your laws, for you yourself have taught me. This is from God Himself. So when you listen to the Bible, you're listening to God. And so that's why I hope that you devour God's Word. You listen to what it says. Because it's from God. And like the litany was saying, and and, uh, gems have been learning, the Bible... The Bible is God's story. We all have stories to tell. We've all been places and done things and learned things over our lives. We all have stories to tell. But there's one grand story that encompasses all of ours. And that's God's story. And there's a lot of little stories in this story. And so there's certain stories like People like David and Daniel, Gideon and Esther. But these were just actually, if you read these stories, they were actually just ordinary people who trusted God. These, these stories that we learned in Sunday school and, and sometimes in church and, and ones that we're familiar with, these weren't super saints. A number of years ago already, I remember this sermon series still stays with me. It did a series on perfect people and how every one of these heroes of the Bible was actually somebody who was very flawed. Somebody who made some very bad wrong turns in their lives and they were regular people. They just happened to trust God. And when you trust God... God does some pretty incredible things. So, these people, David, Daniel, Gideon, Esther, they're not the heroes of the story. God's the hero of the story. The point is that we can trust God and be victorious like they were. That's the point. When you read these stories of the Bible, I want you to see how they were just regular people who trusted God. And I I hope that you think, I could do that too. There's Goliaths in my life that I could stand up against. There's lion's dens that I have to face. And I don't have to be afraid because God's going to be with me. Or like Esther, there's there's some conversations that I'm going to have to have that I'm not looking forward to, but I can do it. If Esther trusted God, then I can too. Everything in the Bible is about God and how He saves. There are these people who go through these difficult times, even to the point of death, and God delivers them. God delivers them in one way or another. And even with Jesus on the cross... Jesus still had to die. And all of us, we're going to have to die someday unless Jesus comes back in our lifetime. But with the story of Jesus on the cross, we know what happens in the end. So we don't even have to be afraid of death. God's story peaks with Jesus Christ, who is God's Word in the flesh. God's Word in the flesh. So this entire book here talks about Jesus Christ. The whole thing does. Look at the the screen here with me if you would. Who is this mediator? True God and at the same time truly human and truly righteous. Our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who has given us to set us completely free and to make us right with God. And again, how do you come to know this? The Holy Gospel tells me God Himself began to reveal the Gospel already in paradise. Later, He proclaimed it by the holy patriarchs and prophets and portrayed it by the sacrifices and other ceremonies of the law. Finally, He fulfilled it through His own dear Son. So there's a lot of what you might say, boring parts of the Bible, but it all points to Christ. It all points to Him, one way or another. So just some three things for you to think about. The world will tell you, believe in yourself. The Bible will tell you, believe in Jesus. Believe in yourself is what the world will say. But the Bible says, believe in Jesus. Don't don't trust yourself, is what the Bible will say, because you in your heart, our hearts, are sinful. We get some things right, but there's a lot that we don't get right. And so we need to, instead of believing in ourselves, we need to believe in Jesus, because He knows what's going on. The world will tell you to follow your heart. The Bible will tell you to follow Jesus. The world wants you to to look within. We, we, the Bible says, look up. Look, Look to the Lord for your guidance. And there's times to look in, of course, doesn't mean we can never look in and who, who am I, what, what, what am I like and stuff, but we kind of do that enough. And the world will say, do what makes you happy. The Bible will say, do what makes God happy. Those can be very two different things. We need to pay attention to that. We need to listen to what God has to say. We need to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, which this Word of God proclaims. And I hope you will choose truth, the truth that's found in God's Word. Let's bow our heads and pray. O Lord our God, You've given us a lamp for our feet and a light for our path in your word and in your son, Jesus Christ. We pray, O Lord, that we would use this light that you've given to us. Lord, not the the light within or the light that's around us, but Lord, the light that comes from you. And we pray, O Lord, that we would see things as you see them. And Lord, that we would walk in your ways and seek your truth and that we would choose your truth in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.